Michael Kasky Blomain, CBS Sports, set to join us here on the Sports Bash on a Tuesday as uh, obviously uh, there's a lot surrounding Ben Simmons yet again. MKB, what's going on? How are you, pal? What's up, Mike? I'm doing well. How are you? All is good, man. I know uh, you were on vacation. Hopefully all that went well for you. But uh, while you were gone, a lot of stuff happening and continues to go on. So let's start uh, with the latest on Ben Simmons with Kendrick Perkins laying maybe kind of a bomb yesterday. I don't know uh, how much of that is actually accurate, but he's saying, hey, listen, I'm hearing he's willing to not show up for training camp. That would put the Sixers in a little bit of a precarious situation, would it not? Yeah, it, it absolutely would, Mike, because they've been operating, you know, under the impression that they technically could bring Ben back into the fold at the start of next season if, you know, a deal that they like doesn't materialize over this offseason. Um, you know, I think they've been operating feeling that they could do that and they could bring him back and they would, you know, at least be able to start the season as a cohesive unit and, and progress and see how things go from there. But obviously if Ben's at the point now where he doesn't even want to report for training camp, um, you know, it, it puts the Sixers in a difficult spot and really leaves them with only one of two options. You either, you know, bring him back and run the risk of him being unhappy and potentially poisoning the locker room, or you, you know, basically make yourself find a deal for him before the uh, season starts, even if it's not necessarily, you know, the exact type of deal that you were initially hoping for. So it, it's definitely uh, throws a wrench in their plans if that is, you know, in fact accurate. Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, that's Kendrick Perkins, a guy who has, you know, he's been a player in the league. I'm sure he has uh, some sort of connections. He said Ben Simmons is not answering the phone calls. He's not the first person to say that. That has been reported. Um, if he's not answering the phone calls, he don't want to be with the Sixers. And from what I heard, this is Kendrick Perkins, says he's he's willing to not report to training camp and will go as long as it takes for him to get out of Philly. Um, are we at the point now where we're starting to think that Ben Simmons does not want to be here? You know, Mike, obviously I haven't talked to Ben personally, so it's tough to address that. I can tell you from what I heard, though, that he was, you know, definitely bothered by – you know, the way things kind of transpired at the end of the, the this past season. Obviously, he was disappointed in his own play, you know, of course. But, uh, you know, I've heard he was also disappointed with the way that, you know, Joel kind of went out of his way to point the finger at him in that post-game press conference that you and I, you know, after Game 7, we were both there. The doc didn't necessarily, you know, stick up for him to the same manner that he had throughout the course of the season. And then, of course, you know, Ben doesn't pay too much attention to social media from what I've heard, but it's basically been impossible for him not to hear – you know, the chatter and the buzz from the Philadelphia fans and things like that and the media members saying that the Sixers need to trade him and this and that. And I think he's at a point right now where his ego is definitely shaken a little bit. His confidence is a little shaken a bit. And I think he's a little bit hurt by the fact that the organization didn't necessarily, you know, publicly have his back after what was obviously a very tough and underwhelming series for him. So, you know, I don't know if he's at the point where he's ready to cut all ties with the organization completely but, uh, you know, I have heard that he is kind of upset with the situation, and that's probably why, you know, there's been reports that he's keeping his distance so far, um, you know, this offseason. Yeah, I mean, I get it. Like, he has uh, not done himself any favors, let's say that. And I'm no Ben Simmons hater by any stretch of the imagination. But for him to be able to – for him to come out and basically say, well, I don't want to – you know, I'm not taking calls. I'm not even going to try to – I think they've been pretty good to him, right? I mean, uh, this is kind of – if he's not answering the calls and basically saying I wouldn't report – uh, th that is kind of small on Ben's part. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you there, Mike. And again, you know, I don't know if that's true, but if that is the case, uh, you know, I think it's going to take him to look, you know, look in the mirror. This obviously all starts with, you know, him underperforming, for lack of a better word, in that playoff series against Atlanta. Uh, even if he had done a couple, you know, been a little bit more aggressive down the stretch, um, you know, obviously that passed up dunk a little bit better from the foul line. And this would have been a non-topic heading into the offseason. I think his play... And now what perceives to be kind of a lack of accountability on his end, if it yeah. is true that he's not, you know, not taking the calls, not wanting to have anything else to do with the team, you know, that's an indictment on him. And I think and to an extent his character and the fact that he needs to be able to, you know, admit that this all starts with his play. And until he does that, you know, it's really tough to tell in what direction both he and the Sixers can kind of move forward. Michael Kasky blooming at The Real Mike KB, CBS Sports covers the NBA and the Sixers. Another Simmons video, which uh, is three summers in a row of him <laughs> shooting the three. This one, he's with Rondo. And I don't have a problem. Like, okay, I'm working. The problem I have is, Michael, you're working your ass off shooting threes for three summers in a row and have never utilized that shot in a game. So you're essentially wasting your time. 
show us a video of you working on something else. Like, how about a free throw? Like, I don't mind if, if he put him making 90 out of 100 free throws. I'd say at least he's working on something that he will utilize. But the frustration, I think, comes from because I don't believe he can't make it. It's that he won't take it. Yeah, that's 100% right, Mike. And I think that's why this time you're seeing, you know, that video has been circulating and the reaction has been overwhelmingly negative or, you know, kind of sarcastic, tongue-in-cheek. And I think for that exact reason, you know, a couple years ago when the first video of him, you know, pulling up threes and hitting threes surfaced, it was exciting because we're like, oh, we haven't seen this yet. Hopefully this translates next season. He could take a huge step forward. But like you said, that obviously hasn't been the case for the past two couple seasons. And now at, at this point, I think everyone is just kind of over it, you know, until it actually materializes in a game. Uh, to him, you know, to see the same thing over and over again. Like you, we've talked about this before. You know, anyone that's been to the warm-ups for a Sixers game at Wells Fargo Center knows that he's capable of making threes. He does it regularly, routinely. Uh, you know, he'll make several in a row from the corners, from the wing. And then, you know, once once the ball gets tipped, he just doesn't do it. So, it's again, it's at that point where he just needs to make that transition from, you know, doing it in these practice videos and getting that confidence to it translating on the court. And I did think the fact that he was working with Rondo was a little interesting. You know, if you're looking to get your three-point skills up, he's not necessarily the first guy that would, uh, you know, come to my mind to be a guy that you'd want to practice with. But like you said, I mean, hopefully well, this is the year that it finally translates. But until me, it does. Let me interject yeah. on the Rondo thing. Does that add some credibility? Is that, hey, he's working with a – like many people respect Rondo as like a future coach and that's someone who is very smart – does it kind of add that it's not just Simmons doing this on his own, that he's actually with another guy who can say, look, you're struggling at this, I'm struggling at this, let's do this together. Does that add any credence to this? Yeah, yeah, I think it does, Mike. I think anytime when you see a guy working out with other NBA players as opposed to just trainers or, you know, his personal staff, I do think that adds a level of credence to it. And a guy like Rondo – you know, I joked he's obviously not the best three-point shooter, but in a way, I do think he could actually be useful to working with Ben because he is a guy that has improved um, that his shot and his three-point shot over the course of his career. He came in the league as a guy that shot in the, you know, right around 20, 25 percent from three with the Celtics early on. And he's, you know, he's by no means Steph Curry at this point, but he's bumped that average up to well over, you know, 30 percent for his career. I think he was over 40 percent uh, last the last couple of years. So he's he's definitely a guy that's improved his shot. And if he, like you said, he has that kind of coach, he's a veteran, that that sort of mental or uh, mentorship thing going on. And if he can kind of give Ben some advice on how to follow in his footsteps in terms of improving his shot, you know, that's it, it's worth a shot at least, I guess. It, it, like, okay, so you said it. The, the fans were very tongue-in-cheek. They were kind of not happy with, okay, we've seen this. It goes back to the Fultz video. We saw the Fultz videos, and that never happened. And then so the, the fans are tired of seeing these little – nuggets put out there but if Ben Simmons put out a video of him at the free throw line shooting 100 free throws do you think that would get the same reaction or do you think people would at least say all right you're working on something that we can see the fruits of your labor come game time yeah I do think the reaction would be a little bit different Mike and I think basically what you said would be the thing because basically you're you know you got to crawl before you walk and I think to me and a lot of people we're watching Ben come off a, a series where he, you know, literally couldn't even make a free throw and didn't have the confidence to step up and do it. So it seems to kind of be a leap to, you know, to me or to an average fan to say, all right, he's going to go from that to next season. He's going to come out and be pulling up these threes that we're seeing him make in the video. Whereas if he's on the foul line and putting in 100, 200, 300 shots a day, you know that's going to come in handy because he's a, you know, a physical, strong player and he's going to get fouled. You know, that's a definite. Is he going to shoot threes? That's obviously not a definite. So I do think, you know, if it was him working on a different skill, it would be the reaction would be a little different as opposed to the same video that now we've seen, you know, multiple summers in a row that hasn't yet panned out yeah. on, in games. MKB, uh, all right, summer Sixers in action yesterday. Maxi, man among boys uh, out there. I, I wouldn't even be surprised if they shut him down or if he plays maybe one more game. He's just so much better than everyone out there. But that's a good thing, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely, Mike. I think that's what you want to see from a guy like Maxi. You know, usually second-year guys, if they're legitimate NBA players, they definitely start to separate themselves in summer league compared to, you know, some of the rookies and the unsigned guys and the two-way guys. And I think that's exactly what we saw from Maxi yesterday. To me, he was, you know, far and away the best player on the court in that game. He looked really confident with the ball in his hands, pulling up, you know, making plays for other guys. So I think, you know, he'll, he'll probably play in the next couple games. I would 
be shocked or I wouldn't be shocked if the Sixers cut his minutes back a little bit to, you know, just make sure he's healthy. But to me, it was a really promising thing because he's a guy that, you know, not only do the fans want to see more of next year, I think the Sixers, given the fact that they've, you know, stood pretty pat in terms of their roster construction compared to last year, you know, he's a guy that could really be an X factor for them if he's able to, you know, take another step forward for them next year. So seeing what he was able to do in that summer league, to me, was definitely a, you know, a pretty promising sign. Yeah, I mean, he dominated in the game, and I think uh, you might have tweeted this out, like he could be there six-man instant offense off the bench. He might usurp um, Shake Milton's role from, from last year if if he continues to develop and show throughout this summer. So it's all good things from him. Isaiah Joe, what is the expectation from him? He, you know, he obviously is a guy who's a shooter. People would think of him as a one-dimensional guy. So what are you looking forward for from him in the summer league? And what is your expectation for him uh, at what, you know in uh, the rotation, not a rotational player? Yeah, it's tough, Mike. I think at the beginning of the year. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I got disconnected for a second. I think, you know, coming into the year, I think it's going to be hard for him to get the minutes that, you know, solid minutes that are going to be there consistently. I think he's the type of guy that, given his ability to spread the floor with his shot that we saw some of yesterday in that summer league game, you know, he's going to be a guy potentially like Cork Miles was a couple of years ago where he's going to get some spot minutes just because of his ability to space the floor, you know, around Joel, around Ben. And if he's able to develop around the edges, other parts of his game, you know, he is the type of guy that has the skill set that could potentially crack the rotation. And, you know, the Sixers obviously didn't do much to bolster their bench yet, uh, you know, in free agency or in trades. It's a lot of the same guys that, you know, we saw last year. And with that being the case, I think there will be opportunity for a guy like Isaiah Joe or obviously Maxi that we just talked about to really step up and, and grab some of those minutes that, that should be available. Uh, the other guy's Paul Reed uh, looking for, you know, I, I was, you know, I guess what you're looking for for him in these summer league games, Michael, is can he step out? Can he stretch? Can he be a stretch four kind of guy? Yeah, I think he can, Mike. I mean, he, he has that, that ability, obviously, to stretch the floor. He has nice size. I think, obviously, bringing in Andre Drummond as the backup to Joel is going to limit his, uh, you know, his, his production and his opportunity on the court a little bit. But I do think the Sixers are high on, on what he can bring to the floor. Obviously, he showed off his athleticism. Uh, kind of had a nice dunk yesterday, a couple other nice plays. So I think he's a little bit raw still to be a type of guy that could – get you know consistent minutes especially in a doc rivers lineup with a team that is expected to contend for a title but to me the main takeaway i had watching that game is that the sixers really do have a lot of promising young talent which is kind of impressive when you consider you know how many pieces and things that they've had to give away over the past couple years to kind of build into this the team that they have now but the fact that they're able to you know they have young guys like maxi like paul reed like isaiah joe obviously we didn't even talk about springer who made his debut yesterday i think you know they have a pipeline of young talent which is going to be you know really important moving forward as they continue to try to you know be a contender but also keep keep young blood in the rotation yeah and uh, you mentioned Springer he was the first round pick this year I guess Bassey uh was there something wrong with him why was he not able to really get any minutes yesterday because he was a guy I was kind of excited about yeah, that's, that's a good question, Mike. I was kind of surprised by that also. Uh, you know, I didn't get any explanation specifically as to why the the, pl the playing time was so low. I do think he's going to be a guy that plays, uh, you know, more in the summer league moving forward. And I think that, you know, a lot of the fans like yourself want to see, uh, you know, what, what he can bring to the floor. But, you know, moving forward, hopefully he, he gets some more time in these games. All right. Uh, summer League Sixers continue. We'll have more on our website, 973ESPN.com. Uh Korkmaz signed. That's official now. Three years, fifteen million for him. What you think of uh, Drummond and Yang? Yeah, you know, neither one were you know super exciting moves to me. I thought Drummond was was a, a bit of an upgrade from Dwight Howard, at least on the offensive end. I was surprised, obviously, given the you know the history between him and Joel and the fact that <laughs> you know he he just turned twenty eight today. Andre Drummond. Today's his birthday, actually. Uh, still just 28, a two-time All-Star, a guy that started in basically every game that he's played in his career since his rookie year. Uh, you know, for him to be willing to, to come in and take a backup role to Joel, I thought was pretty surprising. But, you know, obviously I thought Dwight last year was the best backup that Joel's had since, you know, that he was drafted. And the fact that, you know, he's going to miss time, he's going to miss some games, even if he's healthy. The Sixers obviously like to be cautious with him. And I think having a reliable backup like Dwight was last year, like I think Drummond can be, is, you know, it's huge for the team. So I, I did think that that was a, a good move. And Yang obviously is a guy that's going to come in 
we saw him in Utah. He can space the floor, kind of take that Mike Scott role, but be, you know, hopefully a little bit more consistent from long range. So, you know, I thought there were solid moves, not, not huge, you know, moves that really turn the, take the team up another level, but I thought there were solid moves a- along the line. And, you know, the way they're con- constructed right now, I think it's a lot of it's going to just have to be internal improvement unless obviously, unless a Ben Simmons trade comes up on the horizon before the season starts, um, you know, it's going to be up to a lot of the guys like we were talking about, Maxi taking a step forward, Matisse taking a step forward, uh, Ben, Joel, those guys just continuing to develop or, you know, otherwise it's going to be a, a very similar team to what we saw last year. I think. Uh, Michael, uh, we'll leave you with this. You know, Simmons is a big, very hot topic. Uh, the comments from Perkins yesterday certainly muddied the waters a little bit. Are you feeling any differently about Simmons potential future now? Yeah, Mike, a little bit. I think it would be hard not to. Again, obviously, I don't know the quite the how much truth is behind that report from Kendrick Perkins and some of the other things. But, you know, if it is true that Ben is at a point now where he's questioning his future with the Sixers, that, you know, it's definitely different. I was, I've been kind of under the impression that the Sixers were, you know, shooting for the stars in a Simmons trade. But if they weren't able to capitalize on something this summer, that they were going to bring him back. Uh, you know, start the season with the same starting five as they had last year, go from there, see if, you know, maybe he was able to improve or if not, maybe he would at least bump his stock up a little bit compared to how he ended the season. But like we were saying earlier, if he's not interested in that, that that changes the game completely. So, you know, for the rest of this next month or month and a half, it's going to be really interesting to see how really how Ben feels about the situation because he doesn't have much leverage in terms of where he can go in a trade, but he does have leverage in terms of if he doesn't want to be here, he could put the, the organization in a really difficult spot well i mean and you look at i mean you could look at a situation similarly to what happened with james harden where he didn't want to be there and they didn't want to trade him and then it was just a complete charade you know once the season kind of started right and i don't think the sixers want that and i think you see you know in the nba most of the time the star player when it comes to a guy wanting a trade if that's where ben's at you know most of the time they they get their way whether or not it's you know he might not get to choose where he goes but if he wants off the sixers and he makes that clear uh you know i think it's more than likely that they'll oblige ultimately okay uh we'll keep our eyes on that and obviously dame lillard uh, we'll see what happens now that the olympics are over does that change that whole scenario uh, and obviously Bradley Beal, he'll be back from the Olympics as well. Michael Kasky, blow main at the real Mike KB from CBS Sports covers the NBA. Uh, the NBA Summer League is uh, going on all right now. We'll have you up to date on that and more. MKB, man, always appreciate it, pal. Thanks, Mike. Good talking to you, man. Have a good week.